The bright promise of Badfinger had dimmed by the summer of 1975. Bad luck, bad management, and bitter infighting had combined to wreck the hopes of a band once hailed as the next Beatles. And when the heavy journey's done, I rest my weary head. Broken financially and spiritually, 27-year-old Pete Ham had committed suicide that spring. His friend and bandmate, Tom Evans, was devastated by Pete's death. Well, it wrecked him, you know, for quite some time, and I don't think he ever got over it. Obviously, Pete's loss was, was a great tragedy to him. The surviving members of Badfinger drifted apart. Mike Gibbons became a session drummer in Wales. But by 1978, Tom Evans was out of the music business, and so was Joey Marland. While Tom was insulating pipes in Surrey, England, Joey was laying carpet in Los Angeles. I knocked knock, knock on my door one day. There's a guy there, and two, two guys, a tall guy and a short guy, both from Chicago. They're my new band, they tell me. Drummer Kenny Hark and guitarist Joe Tanzen were devoted Badfinger fans. They convinced Joey to start a new band. Joey invited Tom Evans to join them. We flew Tommy out, we rehearsed, and it was it just clicked instantly. We went to the studio, made some demos, and uh, we got a lawyer. And the lawyer took the tapes to uh, Electra. And they listened to the first two songs, I think, and said, what do you want? Electra gave the band a big advance, but demanded they call themselves Badfinger. It was an ill omen, as the new Badfinger made their first album, The Old Jinx followed them into the studio. From the beginning, it was a troubled project. For Joey Molland and Tom Evans, the trouble was drink and drugs. Drugs were around. I think far too much uh, time was wasted with them. Uh, the music became a little less important at that point. Substance abuse and musical disagreement undermined the effort, and when Airwaves came out in the spring of 79, it flopped. Seeing Tommy being bad-fingered without Pete was kind of hard. I think Tommy was a lost soul. Tom and Joey made one last album as Badfinger in 1981. And while Hold On held on to a spot at number 56 on the singles chart that spring, the album went nowhere. The record company wanted us to go and do another record. It was a two record deal. So we go to the, 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 uh, the rehearsal and the guy tells us, I've only got half of the money. And I told him I'd come back when the, um, you know, when they had the money. And uh, I went home. I told, you know, the, the, all the guys all agreed, I thought, and we all went home. Well, the next day I was told that I'd left the band and that Tommy and, and Tony were now the band. Well, I said, oh, f those guys then. While Joey assembled his own version of Badfinger, Tom accepted a touring offer from a Milwaukee promoter in 1982 and recruited Mike Gibbons and Bob Jackson to join his version of Badfinger. But before Mike and Bob could intervene, a desperate Tom had already signed contracts with the Milwaukee promoter. By the time I'd got there, Tom had signed all this stuff with him. Publishing stuff, management, all, you know, the whole caboodle. So Tommy was, I mean, he was like, well, what have I done, what have I done? I've signed my friggin' life away, you know? The promoter housed the band in a vacant model home in Milwaukee. He stuck us in there and said, don't worry, the gigs are coming. But they didn't come. My good buddy, Tommy Evans. Tommy, welcome to Milwaukee. <laughs> we did one TV, a, a, a shock horror thing with a weird character called Toulouse Stone Neck. Boy, here it is. Come and get it. But you better hurry, cause it's going fast. <laughs> Mike Gibbons soon quit. Then a sad situation got worse, as Joey Marlin moved to end the problem of two different dueling Badfingers. I called the Musicians' Union and I told them, uh, my name's Joey Marlin and I'm go I've got my band Badfinger and we're going on tour. And there's another guy, and they're going to have a band Badfinger and I, want I don't want them to be able to sign any papers. He said, okay, we won't let them do any union gigs. Joey, Joey right now is, is off. He's, he's following the agent. I'm following a different gig and saying this is not real Badfinger. By early 1983, Joey succeeded in stopping Tom from calling his band Badfinger. Tom returned to London, his wife Marianne and their six-year-old son. 
Tom was dealt another blow as Joey Mollen, Mike Gibbons, and former manager Bill Collins began pressing him for a share of the song royalties Tom had been receiving for Without You. According to Tom's former bandmates, the members of Badfinger had an unwritten agreement to split the royalties for all the songs they recorded together. Tom focused his anger and frustration on Joey. He broke the band up, or he's done a lot of things. And now it's over. It's dead. The happiness is bitter now. At the same time, Tom was also being sued for $5 million by the Milwaukee promoter. In the night, he get up at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and he said, what I'm going to do, and, like, I'm going to lose everything. I can't even afford to pay the lawyer. Frightened and deeply depressed, Tom Evans retreated into a fog of drink and drugs. On the night of November 17, 1983, he made a frantic call to Joey Molland. And he says, uh, what the f*** am I going to do about the money, Joe? I said, I don't know, tell him. We've got to sort it out, Joe, we've got to sort it out. He started to get really angry with me. Anyway, he says, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> I said, what? Are you gonna, I'm, going to, I'm going to kill myself, I'm going to do it tonight. Tommy was very angry and upset and fed up, and, and Tommy only said, uh, I'll be dead before I get any money. Marianne calmed Tommy down, and later that night, he called his brother David. He said, yeah, I know Marianne's here with me now. We're having, you're having a really good time. And it was great to hear him sounding so uh, upbeat like that. It's like he changed his mood from the phone call. He was really, really angry, and suddenly he got into a happy mood again. Which was strange, the mood swing. The next morning, Tom and Marianne's six-year-old son woke up early. Stephen came in the bedroom and he said, where's daddy? And then he went outside and uh, he saw his father and he said, there's a man hanging there, he looks like my dad. Stephen's father was hanging from a willow tree in the backyard, a suicide at the age of 36. I can't remember what happened after that. I think they gave me an injection to sedate me. For those close to Tom, the news of his death was sadly familiar. I can't live. exactly what had happened and I just thought to myself you bastard Tommy would say one day I'd be up where Pete is it's a better place than down here I kind of think that he felt if he went in the same way he would go to the same place Pete loved each other it was me and Pete Pete and I 